members can do the needful with any electronic devices. Um, and if you're content, we will record today's evidence session by Hansard. Um, if there's any declarations of interests, financial or otherwise, now is the appropriate time to declare them relating to the business today. If not, we proceed. Um, I have no apologies uh, from members at this stage. So the key item on the agenda today is the oral evidence session with the Minister for Justice. Um, the committee agreed on the 1st of October that we would schedule an oral evidence session with the Minister on the legislative error resulting in the convictions of 15 individuals for certain sexual offences prosecuted between 2009 and 2017 being set aside. Some members also identified other issues that uh, wish to be raised with the Minister. Um, the Minister, as members know, uh, is unable to attend the committee uh, on a Thursday afternoon due to meetings of the Executive. Therefore, arrangements have been made for her to attend today and we'll have a, a follow-up meeting with the Minister on the 15th of December. Uh, given the limited time that's available for each session, members were asked to consider the issues that they wanted to raise to prioritise for this meeting. So in addition to the legislative error, the Minister has been advised that the committee wishes to discuss the Victims' Payment Scheme and the Department's legislative programme and the relevant papers are in their meeting pack. Uh, the committee, just to remind members, did write to the Minister on the 7th of October indicating that it did not believe that the approach of asking a departmental lawyer to investigate the factors that led to the legislative error was sufficient and it considered an independent investigation as being necessary. The committee advised that it was willing to engage on terms of references for such an inquiry and asked the minister to provide options uh, for same. The committee also highlighted its concerns regarding the delay in officials bringing the issue to the attention of the minister and asked for details of the procedures uh, in place to bring such issues to her attention and her expectations from officials in this regard. The committee also asked the Minister to keep it updated regarding the funding position in respect of victims' payment scheme and, in particular, the outcome of the meeting with the Secretary of State on the matter. Uh, responses have been raised in relation to the issues uh, raised regarding the legislative error, and they can be found in your tabled pack. The Minister has advised that she is content that she was fully and properly briefed at the right time by officials and does not see any merit in embarking on an independent inquiry and she will provide the analysis and any recommendations for change arising from the investigation from the senior departmental lawyer by the end of the year and has provided terms of reference for that investigation. The Minister also responded members to the committee request for information on criteria the department uses to decide when to inform of any incidences and the proposal to develop an agreed an approach or protocol for advising of incidents and, the importance, uh, and important matters in a timely manner. Um, the response, members, is on pages 13 and 16 of your table pack. Uh, the Minister advises that she does not consider it practical or possible to define specific criteria against which the Department assesses what information to share with this committee and when she is also of the view uh, that it would not be possible or necessary to develop this protocol. She is, however, committed to ensuring where practical information on developing situations is shared with the committee in a timely manner and uh, the Minister will be invited to make brief opening remarks. So that's just a summary of where we're at on the issues that we're going to look at today. We'll allow the Minister and Peter to, to take their places and then we shall proceed. Um, so the Minister's been asked to speak for five minutes and then we're going to go into questions on all of the areas. So just take your ease, members, for one moment while the Minister comes in. Minister, you're very welcome. Peter, you're very welcome to the to the meeting. Thank you for the invitation. That's all. So just for the record, it's the, the Minister for Justice, Naomi Long, and Peter May, the Permanent Secretary in the Department of uh, Justice, and you're both very welcome to the meeting. And as normal, we'll record the session by Hansard and a transcript that will then be published in due course. So, Minister, I'm going to invite you to make some opening remarks and then we'll get into the core business of the Okay, meeting. perfect. Well, thank you, first of all, for the invitation to come to committee. Um, as you know, it normally your committee meets at the same time as executive, so it's often difficult. So I'm really appreciative of your flexibility in terms of doing this today. Um, a lot has happened since I last briefed you at the end of April. Um, before I turn to the issues that you have highlighted, I'm just going to say a few words about <coughs> other recent challenges 
No one, I think, could have predicted um, the impact of the COVID pandemic and the challenges that we're now facing in the second wave. The impact has been felt across the entire department, but ensuring safe and secure custody for people in the care of the prison service has been a particular priority. Not surprisingly, the higher rates of infection in the community are also leading to more cases being identified amongst prison staff. However, governors continue to report that they have the resources they need on a daily basis. Northern Ireland Prison Service have also innovated and adapted quickly by introducing virtual visits, virtual learning, and looking for new ways to allow for temporary release testing while still mitigating the risk of infection. The measures put in place will be kept under review, but realistically, some of those will have to remain in place until the risk of the virus diminishes significantly. Another key focus for recovery from the first wave of the pandemic was getting the courts operational again. Following the initial outbreak of COVID, court business was consolidated into five court hubs. Jury trials were also suspended and other in-person hearings were consolidated into the hubs. Virtual courtroom capacity was significantly increased with additional video conferencing facilities installed to facilitate remote and hybrid hearings. However, over the last number of months, measures have been introduced to ensure courts and tribunal business can resume safely and sustainably. That has required the reconfiguration of courtrooms to ensure the safety of everyone using them. Options are also being explored for additional accommodation, raising from the installation of temporary modular buildings within the current estate through to the lease or hire of suitable alternative accommodation, such as other public sector buildings and arts venues that can be used as waiting areas or consultation facilities. <clears throat> it's hoped that these Nightingale Court venues will begin to come on stream over the next few months. Although the response to COVID has, been, has inevitably dominated um, the efforts in recent months, <clears throat> it hasn't been at the expense of progress in other important areas of work for the Department. That includes, for example, the introduction of the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill, raising awareness of the help available for abuse victims, particularly during lockdown, scrapping the Criminal Injuries Compensation Scheme Same Household Rule, drafting a Prevention of Stalking Bill, launching a public consultation in conjunction with the Department of Health, on proposals for a new uh, care and justice campus to support those vulnerable children with complex needs, recruitment and training of independent chairs for domestic homicide reviews, developing a private family law early resolution action plan aimed at improving outcomes for children and families by supporting early resolution of more parental disputes, and the Health Minister and I plan to launch the action plan before Christmas. Finally, following executive approval of a three-year extension of the Tackling Paramilitarism programme, subject to match funding from the UK Government, planning commenced to ensure a seamless transition into delivery of the next phase of the programme. Turning then to the three areas that the committee highlighted in your letter, and I want to start first of all with the invalid convictions for sexual offences. As you were, an error which led to the Magistrates Court losing the legal power to try some cases affected 17 victims relating to 15 historical prosecutions. I made a detailed statement to the Assembly on the 20th of September and have also been in correspondence with the Committee since. Since I delivered the statement, a senior lawyer within the Department has been taking forward scrutiny of the factors which contributed to the error and will be developing a quality assurance check mechanism to cover future legislation. I have shared the terms of reference with the Committee. The Public Prosecution Service has also contributed to this scrutiny, as well as conducting a separate exercise to review critically its practices and procedures to ensure that such an error could not recur. It is also taking forward a number of actions which I outlined in my statement. That includes engaging directly with those individuals affected, but given the relatively small numbers of people involved, I do not want to go into the detail because I would not want any individual um, to see their own situation laid out publicly. However, the PPS has taken advice from Victim Support Northern Ireland and from Nexus, and support and advice is being offered by these two organisations to those who wish to avail of it. I understand currently there are no outstanding requests for meetings with victims. Just to note that the convictions were formally rescinded by a district judge on the 27th of October. The PPS also aims to make final decisions on re-prosecutions by the end of November 2020, and is engaging with victims to ensure their views are considered. Turning now to the Troubles Permanent Disablement Payment Scheme, um, I wanted to give you a short update to the briefing you received from officials on the 20th of September. First of all, I want to reiterate um, that the development of a scheme for victims and survivors who have lived with severe and permanent disablement as a result of Troubles-related incidents is both positive and long overdue. 
Following designation of the department on the 24th of August, good progress has been made to put in place preparatory arrangements for the new scheme. That includes initial work to develop an IT scheme for administration, um, development of application forms and identifying accommodation for the staff that will support the payments board. The Northern Ireland Judicial Appointments Commission has commenced the process to appoint an interim board, mem uh, interim board members and the aim is to have board members in place by early January. The Lord Chief Justice has also indicated that he plans to make an announcement very soon on an interim president of the Victims Payment Board. Although the funding made available by the Executive this financial year to support development of the scheme was welcome, the issue of funding for the scheme does remain outstanding. I remain of the view that the UK Government has an obligation to make funding available to the scheme. Following a meeting with the First Minister, Deputy First Minister and Finance Minister, we agreed to seek a joint meeting with the Secretary of State and you had asked to be kept updated on developments. Unfortunately, there is nothing to report by way of an update as the meeting has not been arranged to date. However, the Secretary of State wrote to me on the 30th of October, setting out his position that the scheme is a devolved matter and so should be funded by the Executive. <clears throat> I will be engaging further with Executive colleagues to continue to press the UK Government for additional resource. With regards then to the legislative plans for the remainder of this mandate, I appreciate that it is an ambitious programme. However, it addresses areas where there is widespread political agreement on the need for new legal provisions. I believe that it is achievable if we work together. A good model is the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill, where we have worked in partnership to improve and sharpen the bill. And I'm very grateful for your constructive and timely consideration of these issues during your scrutiny of the bill. I have written to respond to your proposed amendments, setting out my position on a number of alternatives, and happy to discuss this further, and indeed for my officials to provide further briefing on that um, later in the week, in the hope that consensus on these can be reached. Um, in terms of upcoming bills, my plans for the remainder of the programme include the Criminal Justice Committal Reform Bill, which was introduced to the Assembly this morning, the Protection from Stalking Bill to be introduced at the beginning of December, the Personal Injury Discount Rate Bill, which we plan to bring forward in January, and the Justice Miscellaneous Provisions Bill, which we aim to introduce to the Assembly around March of next year. Those dates are, of course, subject to approval of the Executive the bills are important to the effective working of the justice system and the protection of a number of vulnerable groups in the community, but it will only be possible to deliver that full package of bills if we work in partnership, and so it would be very helpful if the committee would be agreeable to supporting a degree of overlap between bills, in effect potentially allowing for the call for evidence for one bill to overlap with the latter stages of scrutiny of the previous bill. Introduction of the Committal Reform and Stalking Bills in November and December, respectively, should see both bills comfortably complete all of their Assembly stages next year. I therefore want to focus on the two other planned bills. In terms of the personal injury discount rate, you are aware of my conflict of interest and that I have delegated key policy decisions to the Permanent Secretary. I am not proposing to rehearse the issues you discussed with officials recently, other than simply to stress that it would cause significant difficulties if there was a delay in a new legal framework for setting the discount rate. It is important that this bill goes forward as a matter of urgency, as the legislation matters hugely to those directly impacted by it. The approach being proposed is very similar to that in Scotland, and the substance of the issues is essentially technical in nature. On that basis, I see real merit in taking the bill forward by an accelerated passage. However, I recognise um, that the committee will have concerns about that, and I am happy to have that discussion with committee. It would certainly help to remove uncertainty for personal injury claimants and defendants. Turning to the Justice Miscellaneous Provisions Bill, its successful passage is dependent on the Committee's agreement to a modest overlap of committee stages for the Committal and Stalking Bills and supporting mm. accelerated passage of the Discount Rate Bill. I am particularly keen for this bill to be progressed as it includes the first phase of legislative changes emerging from the Gillen Review, <laughs> as well as important changes arising from the Child Sexual Exploitation Review. So I very much hope that with the same positive and collaborative approach that we have demonstrated in the past, we can work together constructively to make up for the lost legislative ground in this mandate and deliver this important package of legislation. <clears throat> I just want to bring my remarks to a conclusion um, in saying that when I briefed the committee at the end of February, I set out, I think, quite an ambitious work programme for the time that we had ahead. A key component of that was us working collaboratively um, with you to develop innovative and problem-solving practices to some of the more intractable problems within the justice system. I described it as a big agenda, and I said that difficult decisions would need to be made about priorities and how we use our resources. No one could then have envisaged that the scale and magnitude of the difficult decisions that lay ahead uh, with COVID-19 would emerge. 
We continue to navigate our way through those challenges, but um, it, with staff diverted to the COVID response and recovery efforts, it has created inevitable gaps and capacity issues. Put simply, we do not have the capacity to deal with new issues, and there may be a need for some reprioritisation of previous commitments. Nevertheless, I remain committed to ensuring that I deliver on my agenda. Our shared goal remains creating a safer community, although I think we would all accept that the safer community we aspire to very much includes one which is free from the pain and suffering that COVID-19 has brought on all of us. I'm happy to finish there, um, Chairman, and I'm happy to take any questions that members have. Okay, thank you, Minister, and that's helpful, in including the, the overview around COVID and the pressures on the Department, but the, nevertheless, the work that the Department has been doing, notwithstanding all of those pressures. Primarily, there's three key areas that members wanted to engage on today, and I, I know that you've agreed to come back on Tuesday, the 15th of December. So um, I know members will be disciplined in sticking to the three areas um, that, that we're going to discuss today and other areas then we can agree um, for, for that next session. And I think that's very helpful to have the engagement directly with you. As much as we value your officials, it's always good to, to hear directly sure. from the Minister um, as well. So in the first instance, it's just to pick up on the legislative error, and I, I take note of all of the, the rationale that's behind it, uh, and I don't intend to, to dwell on that. You've taken your decision uh, on this. I suppose my, my only question, um, you, you've indicated about the expense of the expense and time-consuming nature that a, an inquiry would take as one of the reasons. Was the criminal justice inspector considered as a potential vehicle to carry out an independent inquiry? It was considered, um, but it was it was not deemed to be appropriate. So Jenny's mission is really to work with us um, on current justice processes and systems to help us improve them, um, and so in that regard, may have input into how we go forward once the um, once the uh, legal advice um, has been given from the review that's ongoing. However, it isn't its role to conduct post mortem post-mortems of historical errors which are identified and where steps are being taken to avoid recurrence. So I don't think that this is something that would be appropriate for Sajini to be involved in um, and that's why that wasn't pursued. Um, I am aware obviously that um, there is a need for us to get this right um, which is why we're working with um, the DPP um, and within the department to ensure that we can identify um, what lessons need to be learned um, and how we can ensure that our systems are strengthened. Particularly, Chair, I would have to say, given that we do have a robust um, and quite lengthy legislative programme ahead of us, I think it is important that we learn from this and we do it quickly. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why I think that by appointing a solicitor to look at it in detail, that's a much more progressive way for us to move forward um, and to ensure that we have answers as quickly as possible. Okay. Um, and was that Sajeni's view? Were they asked? No, they were not asked. It was, a, a it, was, it was yes, it was our view that it wasn't necessary, and it wouldn't fit in neatly with what they are tasked to do with their role. Um, I mean, they may well have views when we bring forward our recommendations. If there are recommendations with regard to change of process, they may well have a view on that. Um, but the kind of review of past mistakes wouldn't be something that they are involved in. It would be inspecting the current systems uh, within justice. Okay, Linda. I'm not coming in on this point, so I think maybe the best way to do it is, is to allow people that are coming in on this particular issue first. Yeah. Well, yeah. Just on the issue around the errors, Minister, you'll know me that, that in regards to the questioning I've given you around this issue is not necessarily around the errors itself, because you very well, very uh, capably set that out in a very good way in this chamber that day. I think it was the 20. On the 8th, I think, maybe? Yeah. Uh, and I appreciate that. My issue and what struck me that day was the fact that, and you know what I'm going to say, it took three months before the officials actually brought a report to you. Now, what intrigues me about that issue is this. How many other issues are sitting bubbling to the surface that you really need to know about? Uh, that worries me. It really worries me for the democratic process. And in an answer you give to me when I asked you a question on this, you said that no one made a decision to withhold information from you. But surely whenever DOJ officials were talking to the PPS, and PPS was talking to DOJ officials, who are basically you, they're, they're re representing you, is it the case that no one, no one in the department, from the secretary down, the actual person who was meeting with PPS, 
is it not the case that they made a decision not to bat it up to you, to at least give you a heads up, a briefing note, uh, or just an inkling of something coming down the line? Well, it is true that it wasn't brought to my attention at that time. So that is accurate. And that, I mean, that is reflected in what I have said. I explained on the 28th of September why it took so long to reach the public domain. Um, but that also involved why it took so long to reach me, because there was quite a detailed process that had to be gone through. And it wasn't, if I may say, a departmental process because this was a an issue for the PPS which they knew would emerge. It was an issue that they were looking into and they were making us, if you like, in the department aware of it so that we could then look to see if there were any issues on, on our side. Um, but when this was originally established as an issue, there was quite a complex process within the PPS in terms of trying to establish, first of all, whether there was a problem. When they identified there was a problem, then they wanted to know exactly what it was and why that was the case. Whether it invalidated the convictions, because that wasn't clear, which cases were covered, um, whether there were any similar errors that might have occurred, um, which would also need to be taken into account. And they also then had to get legal advice um, at several points, as well as going through databases and records it on occasion by hand. But that was a matter for the PPS to resolve because it was ultimately prosecutorial decisions um, that were impacted. So you could argue that someone in the department may have said to me, there's a problem in the PPS, but I'm not responsible for the PPS. It's a non-ministerial um, department. It doesn't, I don't head up the PPS or fund the PPS. Um, it's quite unusual in that it's a corporate soul, so it's a, it's a different arrangement um, to, to the other um, parts of the justice system. So perhaps somebody could have said to me that this was happening in the PPS, but it would be the equivalent of you telling me something that was happening in the Department for the Economy or something that was happening in another, in another outside body, because I have no direct responsibility <coughs> for that. It became an issue for the Department at the point where I was told that there had been an error in terms of the legislation. But that took that length of time to establish. Once it was established as an issue where the department had some involvement, then obviously um, I was notified appropriately. So, I mean, I'm content that if there, you, I mean, you, you've obviously, and I understand why, would be concerned if there were issues bubbling around the department in terms of are there concerns. I have been really clear with all the officials that if people have concerns, if they think there might be problems, um, that we, we operate on a no surprises basis, that I would rather know early and then be given good news that the, the, the problem is eliminated um, than find out late that there's bad news. And to be fair, that is the basis on which we have worked. So I think this was an unusual set of circumstances at an unusual time, because I think some of this may have been more um, quickly expedited. For example, had it not been for COVID, it may well have come to my desk a lot quicker because things would have been able to move faster. But I think in reality, when I was told about it was the right time because that was the point at which the department became involved and engaged in the issue. The fact that there's an awareness that there's a problem somewhere else that I'm not responsible for is, I guess, a matter of, of opinion. I certainly don't feel that I was <clears throat> that I was disadvantaged um, by not knowing. And when I was briefed, I was able to be given the full picture, both from a PPS side, but then I was also told what work we would need to do in the department. And I think that that was the right juncture to give me that briefing. You say you're not responsible for PPS, I, I get that, the, the, the separation, but yet you were the minister who came to the House to give the statement, yeah. and I, 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 I get the point you raise about the fact that you had then established that there was errors in conviction, um, but it, even if you were had been given, I suppose the question is, do, are you briefed on a weekly basis, a fortnightly basis, a monthly basis about things that are happening within your department? Uh, it's really a daily basis. <laughs> daily basis. A daily basis. So, I mean, to be to be fair, um, chair, um, through through yourself. I mean, there is no lack of communication. Um, even though we are working remotely, we are constantly in contact. Um, I am briefed on a daily basis about issues. Things will arrive at me with me that are desk immediate, and I will see them as soon as they as, as soon as they arrive. Obviously, part of the purpose of having um, staff in the department is that they prioritise those things which I need to see immediately, and they deal with those issues that don't require my attention. Um, so, do I know every um, everything that happens in the department at the level? of what people are doing individually, minute by minute, of course not, because that would be inappropriate. People have to be given some trust and confidence in their ability. Do I know if there are significant decisions that need to be made, significant changes that are taking place, significant issues that are arising or concerns? Absolutely, I'm confident of that. So some, someone then must triage that or sequence that 
uh, information flow to you. Now, I'm not asking these questions because I want somebody's head in the block within the department. I don't. I'm just genuinely intrigued as to how it actually the information flow works. Uh, you, you talked an answer to me about trying to create a, a, a positive culture in allowing your department to operate. And I, I'm there with you. I'm 100% there with you. Uh, it just seems to me, smacks to me, that this was a case of, oh, we forgot to tell the minister. Uh, we really should have informed the minister sooner. Uh, because it is a serious issue which has affected people's lives and, of course, then has upset the process of the, the justice system, which is colonel to your department and your responsibilities. So I suppose when you answered my question by saying you want to encourage a positive con culture in your department, is it a negative thing? or a negative culture for you to be informed? No, and I don't think that was what it was implying. I think what it was actually saying, I was rebutting the suggestion that I wouldn't be told, um, because actually people do feel that they're able to escalate issues. And obviously the way this happens is that within each section, uh, within each part of the department, people will raise things with their immediate superior. If they believe it's a serious issue, it will get escalated again, and it will eventually come to the permanent sector or whomever. But to be fair, things don't have to go through, Peter, before they come to me. Very often, um, you know, heads of section will come to me and say, this is an issue we're wanting to discuss it with you but the team meets on a regular basis um, in terms of me meeting with um, each of the teams in the department it also allows me to meet with um, the permanent secretary on a regular basis and as I say that horizon scanning is going on all the time the, the, the difference in this case is that if it was a prosecutorial error I have absolutely no accountability for it now I mean we get into this debate constantly and I know it is to the huge frustration of members of the committee when I'm asked questions about policing when I'm asked questions um about prosecutions when I'm asked questions about the judiciary and, and I say well I'm not responsible for any of those things at an operational level but the PPS in particular I have no responsibility for whatsoever in fact their funding actually comes from the Department of Finance rather than from the Department of Justice you're right they are absolutely critical to the justice system and therefore it's imperative that we have a good working relationship with them but it wouldn't be normal where the PPS made a decision for example to prosecute or not prosecute or whether it was an error in a prosecution or a case for the Justice Minister to answer for that error. It would be a matter for the, deep, for the Director of Public Prosecutions to answer that case to the public directly because he's a corporate soul. So in this case, the unusual aspect of it was that this arose from an error in legislation, which is why I came to the Chamber to answer questions. Under normal circumstances, if this was simply a prosecutorial error, I wouldn't have been answering questions in the Chamber. So I think it was at the point where it arose where we realised that this was due to the lack of the continuance um, for historic offences, that that became an issue. Um, then that was the point where it became an issue that I needed to, to bring to the Assembly's so attention. Here's, so here's the weakness, Minister. Here's I'm the weakness. I'll just uh, on this, I'm going to move on to others after you yep. finish. Just so the last we can question. Get last question. Forward. The weakness in that, Minister, is this. If your department was told in early March and you weren't told until June, what would have stopped a body like PPS or any other body or department in your department sitting on a problem for a year or more? Realising the problem, seeing the problem for what it is, but not doing anything about it. And because you weren't told at the start, you would have had no time appreciation of t how uh, a problem could be resolved. You see the weakness there? No, because in this case, if the, if the Director of Public Prosecutions had decided not to take action in this case and had decided to sit on it, that would not be a matter for me. It would be a matter for the Director of Public Prosecutions because they're entirely independent. He is not answerable to me um, and he is not part of, if you like, this, this accountability structure. There would be no incentive, I have to say, for the public, prosecutor, public prosecution system to, to sit on a problem of this nature because it's in their interest to ensure that the law is upheld and they have professional ethics that would drive the decisions that they make. In terms of people sitting on problems in the department, of course there is always a risk in any department um, that someone will notice something and not pass it on or perhaps not notice the significance of it. But I don't think that that applies in this case. And if I did, I would obviously be having a conversation with those involved to make sure that it wasn't repeated. But I think in this case, it was a very unique set of circumstances. And therefore, I think to try and read it across to wider issues um, would perhaps be on would be unfair on the department. I certainly don't feel, and I think you will know that um, I, 
I've always been fairly um, querying in my, in my issues as a member of a committee. I always held people to account. I don't feel that I'm kept in the dark by the department. If I felt that, they would hear about it. Let's put it that way. That's not the relationship that we have. It is very open. Issues are brought to me well in advance. Very often, issues are raised with me that turn out to be um, not significant. Um, it's for me to decide at the time whether I want to take further action or whether I'm happy to wait and see what, what transpires. So I, I feel confident in the way information is brought to me and I constantly reiterate that, that, that fundamental point that I don't want to be surprised. Things will go wrong in any system of the size and scale and complexity as, as the justice system. So things will from time to time go wrong. Um, and for me, it is about knowing about that as soon as possible and making sure that everything is done to, perfect, to prevent a repetition and to protect um, those who have been affected. And to me, those are the two key things. And both of those things have been done in this case. So I'm confident about how the communication takes place, but I can understand that if you read it across, it may seem like an unusual set of circumstances, because it was. Okay, thank you, Minister. Thank right. you, Chair. Thank you. I have got Gemma, I've got Gordon, I've got Linda, and I've got Doug on this issue, and then I'm going to finish this issue at a quarter past. Uh, I'm not coming in on this issue at the... all. I'll, I'll wait until the victims pick okay, stuff. Okay, the victims is the next one. So, <coughs> four members, we have ten minutes, and then we're going to finish this session. And then we'll move on to victims. So, Gemma. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, my question shouldn't take that long, so you'll be all right. Um, and thanks very much for coming today. Um, my party colleagues on the committee um, and myself have been contacted by a victim who is obviously seriously concerned that the PPS will decide that it's not in the public interest to prosecute, despite this obviously being very important to them. Um, so, in light of this, can you give assurances that the wishes of the victims will be central to the PPS approach to the prosecutions? Well, I mean, I think, first of all, there are a couple of things I can say on this, Gemma. Um, decisions on re-prosecutions in the Crown Court are entirely a matter for the PPS. So it isn't something um, that I can make a decision on or give assurances about. Um, but it is their decision to take in liaison with the victims themselves. Um, as you know, that there are, um, there are plans to make these decisions within the next month. Um, and I appreciate that discussions around re-prosecution will be traumatic um, for some victims and have been assured that they are being supported in the process um, by victim support. Many cases here, the offenders will have already served their sentence and that will also have to be taken into account by the PPS when they make a decision as to whether or not they're going to re-prosecute. Um, if there is a fresh prosecution, then it is a matter for a judge to decide how to take account of any previous sentence. So these are not straightforward issues because this is not um, something um, that happens on a regular basis. I think one thing that I would say is that in terms of the decision whether or not to prosecute, as you know, that comes in two parts. So there's first of all the test of whether there is evidence. Um, to prosecute, and the second is whether there is a public interest to prosecute. Um, but throughout that process, and, and both are assessed separately, so first of all you decide whether or not there is sufficient evidence, then you go on and decide whether or not there is public interest. Um, it will be a matter for the PPS to weigh those in the balance at this stage. In terms of evidence, one would imagine that there is sufficient evidence because they originally were convicted in court. Indeed, some pled guilty <coughs> at the time, and so I think that there is a reasonable um, prospect that there is sufficient evidence, but that will have to be assessed again on a case-by-case -case basis. But the PPS have said that they will take into account, um, amongst the other considerations that they legally have to make, um, the views of victims um, of, of those crimes, because clearly um, their views are significant, particularly in a case like this. And I only had one other question, but you've basically answered it in your answer, so thank you. Okay, thanks, Gemma. Um, and I, I used the tissue so I didn't touch the, the glass now and we don't worry. That's all right, don't worry. <laughs> I wouldn't contaminate it anyway. That's, that's all right. <laughs> um, Gordon. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Minister, and apologies for being late. Just, I think the bottom line is, are you satisfied that the proper procedures and processes are now being put in place to, to reduce the risk of recurrence? I am. I'm confident, first of all, um, that we are going about the right way in the department in terms of putting a solicitor um, who has considerable experience in terms of legislative processes, um, as well as um, considerable um, prosecutorial experience in charge of looking um, at the processes that we need to put in place in the department when we, um, when we are changing legislation and making amendments to bills. 
Um, I think that's important because we need somebody who understands both the, the practice of um, of drafting legislation, but also the practical outworkings of that in the courts. So I think that getting the right person to do this is, has been has been crucial. I believe that you've seen the terms of reference, and I believe that those are robust in terms of what we've asked them to do. Um, I'm also um, heartened um, by the work that's being done by the PPS because I know that they are now being very thorough in terms of their own internal um, system review um, and are keen to work with us um, on, on ensuring that there are no gaps between the two um, through which other such errors can, can fall. I mean, it is impossible um, you know, to say that such an error or mistake can never happen again. Mm. But what we want to do is put in the right procedures and practices to ensure um, that it is highly unlikely that that will happen. I think fundamentally, though, that this is not just an issue of what the department does, but actually it's, a, it's one very relevant to your own committee. Because at the time when, these, uh, when this piece of legislation went through, there was precious little scrutiny, if any at all, um, of primary legislation for Northern Ireland because it was taken through as orders in council in Westminster. By comparison um, to the time that you have spent scrutinising the domestic abuse bill and so on, if that had gone through Westminster as an order in council, it would have got a maximum of an hour and a half debate in the chamber. So, you know, with all due respect to the MPs from Northern Ireland who went there and debated those issues, they could not, in reality... Mm. Um, have been able to scrutinise to the level of detail that you have been able to in a clause-by-clause -clause consideration. They also wouldn't have had the opportunity to refine or amend any piece of legislation. You either take it as a whole or you reject it completely. And so from that perspective, I think that the change in circumstances of having a working assembly with, with assembly scrutiny committees um, has <laughs> itself made a uh, a valuable input into ensuring that these kind of mistakes don't happen again. So I think that that is another part of the, the kind of lines of defence that we have against mistakes. And that is why the scrutiny process matters, um, because actually it is an opportunity for people to ask questions and to challenge um, what is there and perhaps to pick up on things that have otherwise been missed. Um, so I think that both of those things give me confidence that we can move forward and not repeat these mistakes. Um, but as I say, I would be a hostage to fortune if I said there would never be another error in any department, and I won't go down that road. Um, but I do believe that those who are involved in this process are very much committed. It has, been traumatic. it has been traumatic, I have to say, yeah. um, for those dealing with the, with the victims and for the victims themselves. None of us want to be in a justice system where people are found guilty and then walk free um, because of a of an error in terms of, of prosecutions. That's not what we came to this job for. It's not what the department would want to see. It's not what the PPS would want to see. And particularly with sexual offences where, you know, we know that there are very low prosecution rates and very low conviction rates. Um, it's particularly um, it's particularly distressing um, because they're very, very sensitive cases. So we're all determined um, that, okay. w that we will do this properly. Um, the decision we'll process itself then... Is there a signature, a sign-off process for more than one individual is involved that it, would give an assurance that, you know, that there is not a mistake that could be focused on one person? Or is the collective decision process, is that something that needs to be looked at? In terms of um, legislation, I mean, the process is, is quite lengthy in terms of the drafting of legislation in terms of the instructions being drafted for Legislative Council. Um, and then the, the legislation comes back and the Minister will read the bill um, and go through the detail of what that actually means. Um, and then it will be published and not just Assembly members, but actually the public will have a right to read the bill. And that includes people um, who, who work in the different <coughs> system, who will then obviously make representations to yourselves in committee. I think the uniqueness of this situation was that for the entire period uh, while this bill operated and while this error was perpetuated, no one picked up on it, not the prosecutors, not the defence, not the barristers, not the judges, not the department. No one picked up on it because it was quite an obscure issue about a saving clause that hadn't been included. And it's, that's why I'm saying I can't entirely rule out that it will happen. But 
it wouldn't certainly be the case that one person would conceive, draft and pass a bill mm. without it going through quite a number of processes um, beforehand. So the, I think and particularly I would have to say with the ability of the, com the committee to ask additional questions, you'll know that you will have the, the officials before you quite frequently and be able to drill down into the detail yeah. of individual clauses. That's something that just wouldn't have been happening in 2008 at all. Thank you. Thanks, Minister. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Doug, you have the last five minutes. Yes, and I'll, and I'll try and be really brief. Um, uh, and thank you, uh, Minister. I, I mean, I, I've got to be honest, you, your, your answers are, have been really detailed and, and have been really good. I've got to say they've, they've given us a good insight into, into this because this legislation was not drafted by the Office of the Legislative Council. Um, and my concern is, is, is this then, is that how many other pieces of legislation are still sitting there which have not been drafted? Um, by the Office of the Legislative Council, where there may be issues with it. Is there somebody reviewing any of those um, sort of latter pieces of, of, of legislation which may have come in before we de devolved uh, policing and justice? But, but I, I think if I can and, and, and lump it all together, I think what's key is the outcomes of the review, um, because the learning account is what's the most important thing from all of this. And I do have concern, only because I don't know the answer, is whether or not the solicitor has the extensive knowledge of each stage of the legislative process um, uh, in the way in which way statute law is, is drafted. Because if the solicitor doesn't have that in-depth knowledge, they will not pick up on those very unique issues. Um, and I guess maybe that's why we, we thought that maybe this needs to go outside to somebody to have a look at this from a different you know, so we don't know who that solicitor is, we don't know what their sure. their their um what their, their expertise is in, in regards to this. And, and the last one to add on to that, if you can answer it, and it'll kill it all off. Um, have you engaged with the Attorney General to review the review to make sure that it will be a human rights compliant outcome when we do the review? Well, I think I'll, I'll answer the AG point first. The, the review itself of legislation, um, it's, a, it's an internal process review rather than to do with human rights issues, so it wouldn't necessarily be. But the Attorney General, when I shared the, um, when I shared the terms of reference for the review with executive colleagues, it would have been, I think the Attorney General was copied into that letter, so we'd have had the opportunity to comment on the terms of reference. That would be standard um, procedure. Um, with respect to um, the senior lawyer who's conducting the process, I would want to reassure you um, that the Departmental Solicitor's Office have provided a lawyer seconded to the Department of Justice to undertake that scrutiny. They've had a long legal career, um, have extensive practical experience in past and current policy development in the legislative process itself and in planning for implementation of new legislation. Um, so this is somebody who has considerable knowledge and experience and it's not somebody um, who is a kind of junior um, person who's been engaged to do this. It's somebody that we we believe has the considerable experience and um, the mix of experience that is right to be able to look at all the aspects of this um, over a, a lengthy um, legal career. Um, I think also in terms of the scrutiny and recommendation, I mean, obviously you have the terms of reference, but remember that this will this report um, and any recommendations flowing from it um, will be coming to me and will also be shared with you as a committee. So you will have the opportunity um, to have further conversations around whether or not you believe the processes suggested um, are, are adequate. In terms of other legislation, and Peter, you can keep me right on this just so that I'm sure, but my understanding is that one of the pieces of work that the PPS have been doing is to look to see are there other similar issues. This was quite a unique um, set of circumstances, but they have looked to see are there other potential issues around this. And to date, my understanding is that they haven't identified any other significant issues. That's not to say that as they continue with that process that others won't emerge, but at this stage they've not they've not been able to identify any other significant issues in terms of um, similar kinds of cases that might invalidate um, convictions. So I think that um, that work is going on with the PPS at the moment, and I think we can be reasonably um, assured that they will be robust in that. And I mean, we are we are conversing on this on a regular basis just to keep each other appraised of where we're at, because whilst the whilst the public prosecution service is separate to the department. It is correct, it is part of the justice system and therefore it is important that we work coherently um, and effectively together. And we do have a good relationship um, with the PPS, although as I say, it is that arm's length relationship that it needs to be um, from a political perspective. Th th thanks, Minister. Minister, I'll just, just finish if I can, please, because as part of my research, um, 
onto this because it's so important. I wrote to the Attorney General, and the answer I got back from the Attorney General is I have not been contacted about this, and I have no more information than you. I do not know the terms of reference, so you might want to check that we have engaged with the Attorney General. I'm, I'm happy to ensure that the Attorney yeah, General has cited the terms of reference. That, that, um, know, just, just and obviously, given her background, she has particular expertise in okay. yeah. the drafting of legislation as well. So yeah, cool. no, we can do we can do that. Um, as I say, from my point of view, normally when I circulate a, an executive paper, I will copy in the Attorney General as a standard. Um, but if it hasn't happened for whatever reason or she hasn't received it, I'll check. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to go on to the the issue around the victims' um, payment scheme. Um, a couple of questions just initially that I, I want to raise and then I'll, I'll bring Linda in. I suppose time frame, uh, if we're still on course for, I think it was March, for the administrative aspects of this to be ready so that the applications can then be received, is that still the case? We are, yeah. Um, we have made good progress. Um, the I suppose the, the longest part of this was, was anticipated to be the um, appointments to the panel. Now, Jack originally suggested it may take um, somewhere, I think, around three months um, to complete that process. And as you know, that the panel need to make some decisions that will allow us then to implement the rest of the scheme. Um, and so that was always going to be one of the, the kind of limiting factors around how quickly this could be done. However, we've worked closely uh, with NIJAC and they have been able to say that probably six to eight weeks we've been able to give them cover um, in terms of some of the procedures and processes so that hopefully we will be able to see those appointments take place in around six to eight weeks. And that should mean that in the new year we will have the, the panel in place and then they will be in a position to take decisions. It's also helpful um, that the um, Lord Chief Justice, um, I spoke with him last week and he's indicated that he is ready um, to um, to nominate someone as the interim president of the panel, uh, which is also important um, because that will allow them to give some shape um, to, to some of that decision making and we can work closely with them. Um, I have to say that he has already um, allowed um, uh, appointed um, Justice H uh, Huddleston um, in order just to give some guidance around some of the legalities of this as a, a temporary measure, but I think he's going to make a formal appointment in terms of interim president, hopefully um, quite shortly. Okay. Um, part of the, the narrative around the, this payment scheme, I know from speaking to some of the victims' groups, it's been broadly termed as a victims' payment scheme. Uh, and I've certainly had constituents come to me who, on the face of it, I don't believe when I look at the eligibility will be eligible. So an expectation has been created um, that this is something that's universally available to, to victims' payment schemes. And I just think it's important that people aren't re-traumatised, that they think they could be eligible, that they subsequently aren't, because this is for permanent disablement. It is. And I think that's going to be important going forward. What's your view as to how best this scheme can, can be communicated so it reaches the right people, but doesn't, and that's not to put off people that may want to come forward, but that you're not, not, not you, but yeah. the new board or panel aren't inundated and overloaded with vast amounts of applications from people who may not even be eligible. I think there's a very fundamental point, and I mean, I don't know if members picked up on it, but even in my um, opening remarks, I think how we refer to the scheme, the name of the scheme is crucial. Um, the official, the formal name of the scheme is the Troubles uh, Permanent Disablement Payment Scheme, and that's what I refer to it as. And I think whilst it's a bit of a mouthful and therefore it's become the Victims Payment Scheme for shorthand, it is actually important that we start to refer to it as what it is in practice. Um, it will be for disablement, for permanent disablement. And I think we need to do that because there will be a lot of victims who were not permanently disabled but who suffered loss um, in other ways, very significant ways. People um, who were bereaved as a result of the Troubles, for example, who may not necessarily qualify under this scheme unless they also suffered permanent disablement, either psychological or physical. And I think we need to be very candid about that, that this is, a, this is not, um, for example, um, like an Eames Bradley recognition scheme where everyone who suffered would get something, or it's not that scheme, it's simply for those who are permanently disabled. And I think by using the correct name for the scheme as far as is possible, um, it's, it's important um, to communicate that. Um, in terms of what we do, that's what I, I guess that's what we will need to consider when it comes to things like 
the branding and other things around around this um, and also um, when it comes to um, communication around applications and the application forms themselves those are now well developed um, and the applications process and assessment process is, is under development um, but the application forms themselves are now well developed and it will be a matter of really signing off on those once the panel is in place um, but yes I think that the name of the scheme and the shorthand for it is problematic in the sense that for a lot of people they will quite rightly say well we are victims but they won't necessarily be eligible if there isn't permanent disablement. In, in terms of then the applications open obviously there's issues that the committee has discussed around people that are very clearly there's medical evidence it shows there's severe disablement that's obvious and what we don't want is is those victims coming forward and, and evidently they're missing limbs that they have to then be assessed by another panel when there's clear evidence to do that. So where you know, is there scope to make sure that the board have a system in place that people that are severely permanently disabled don't need to go through a rigorous medical assessment when all of that evidence is already there so those non-complex cases can be expedited much quicker than maybe some other cases that will, will require greater levels of evidence? Well, I think there are two separate things. The first is about whether or not people will need to go through a medical assessment. And I think it's true to say that all people under the regulations will need to go through a medical assessment. But the degree to which that medical assessment um, will be complex or demanding um, and so on, I think will vary greatly from person to person. And I think what we would want to do is um, design the assessment process in an intelligent way. Um, so that it takes account. I mean, what we don't want to do is repeat the mistakes that we have seen with some other government schemes where people are having to justify um, things that are obvious to non-medically qualified people who can see what's in front of them. We do want to be in that space because that's not what this is about. So we would want it to be an intelligent um, and responsive system. In terms of prioritisation um, for more straightforward cases, um, I have met myself, um, I've been briefing, first of all, I've met with the, the kind of stakeholder group um, and I've met with them um, already, but I'm also meeting individually with a number of the victims' organisations um, because obviously whilst they're there as part of the Victims' Forum, um, some of them will have slightly different concerns about the scheme and so we're meeting with them individually um, to kind of provide reassurance. And this is one of the areas that has been raised on a number of occasions around those who have very clear lines of evidence um, very clear um, kind of compelling cases which are obvious um, and should be able to be expedited um, the victims payment board as you know has the discretion to decide um, the priority um, of applications um, but they must have regard to the age and health of applicants so that's a requirement um, but beyond that they can also prioritize in other ways so for example if they know that someone is a very straightforward case they would have the ability to decide to expedite those cases. They also have to prioritise a case if the applicant is terminally ill, so that is, is a requirement on them. Um, it will be a matter, obviously, for the board to decide for themselves um, how applicants are prioritised, but it may well um, decide that those applications where you have information which is extensive and largely complete um, would be kind of good to get off their desk and done um, while some of the more complex cases may need a lot more investigation a lot more research and a lot more um, identif identification um, of evidence however the normal procedural steps will still apply so there will still be a, a, an application process a medical assessment and so on but as I say, in designing that medical assessment process, we would want to uh, uh, we would want to design a process which is intelligent and its response to the people um, who apply. And that, that takes me on to my last point then, in terms of the timeliness, timeliness of it, because obviously there will be a significant number of applications as soon as this opens. The ability to triage that and, and having the scope to prioritise based on age, health conditions, having then got whatever the first group of applicants approved. What's the time frame likely to be for their payments to start? Well, I mean, I understand from victims and survivors' perspective that they simply want to see the scheme up running and delivering payments at the very earliest opportunity. And in all my recent engagements, that has been their desire. And I am completely sympathetic and supportive of that. Um, it obviously will be a matter for the Victims Payment Board to decide on the processes in terms of how they'll arrange the payments and so on going forward. 
time frame in terms of when people will begin to receive payments will really depend on how quickly the evidence can be gathered um, to allow each application to be processed and how quickly the, med how quickly the medical assessment can be completed and whether any of the payments um, that are agreed then need to be adjusted if people have received other payments in respect of the same disablement. So there are a number of factors that they will need to look at in terms of how they take it forward. So I can't be definitive um, about when payments under the scheme might commence because the engagement will still be required with organisations that are outside um, our responsibilities. However, we are engaging at this stage um, in a preparatory way with some of the organisations, for example, um, like Prony um, and the police and other records and so on, so that the coroners and, and others, so that where there is a an opportunity for us, if you like, to do preparatory work in terms of how information will be transferred um, and used, then we're trying to get that front loaded so that there are processes in place when people apply and that we'll be able to coll collate that information. For some victims, they will already have much of the hard data that they need in terms of their application. Um, and I suppose the other thing I would say is that we're also, um, there are advocates being appointed, as, as you're aware, who will be there to support victims who are making applications, and they will be able to do some work with victims in advance of their application um, to help sh ensure that their application is complete uh, when it goes in so that they don't end up in a kind of a, a kind of attrition situation where they submit that's it, you know they have to resubmit they're asked for more and it goes on and on and it can become hugely frustrating and stressful for people. We want to make this as clean and uh, and 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 as simple as possible and as stress-free as possible. And I think we can learn from some of the other schemes um, that are around as to how we can do that best. Finally, has there been any scoping of what you believe, or the department believes, could be the number of applicants that may be eligible under the criteria, or maybe too early at this stage? Well, there has been some work done. Um, the, the executive office is doing some work um, with... Um, with a psychologist, I think, from Queen's, psychiatrist from Queen's, in terms of looking to see about the actual figures um, and who might be available. Um, so from that perspective, there is work ongoing to try and do that, because that will also determine um, the size of the panel, because as you know, the, the overall panel then, there are three person assessment teams. So the, the panel will depend on the number of, of applicants in order that they're able um, to take that forward. Initially, there was an estimate of 2,000 victims, um, and those would be potentially eligible for the scheme. So that included the seriously physically injured and seriously psychologically injured who are already in receipt of support from the Victors, Victims and Survivors Service. Um, and then there was a slight uplift on that, recognising that VSS wouldn't necessarily be dealing with all victims because not all would have made contact. That 2,000 figure was worked through by the Government Actuaries Department to give um, some assessment of the likely kind of full lifespan costs of the scheme, um, and they looked at things like backdate and the number of people who would take um, the number of people who would, for example, choose to take a lump sum rather than um, getting the payment every year, and they estimated the cost of that. The Commission for Victims and Survivors has been engaging with a psychologist at Queen's um, to consider estimates of the potential number of victims who may be eligible for the scheme as a result of severe psychological injury. And as you know, the threshold for that has also decreased from, I think, 40 per cent um, to 14. So that figure at the minute, they estimate could be anywhere between three and a half and seven thousand people. So significantly more um, than the 2000 initially estimated. Um, so TEO um, hasn't confirmed with us um, the total estimated cost of the scheme because they are obviously responsible um, for developing the business case and estimating the costs, um, whilst we are responsible for delivering the nuts and bolts um, so the scheme can be delivered. Um, but we reckon that it will be significantly higher than the original estimate, which was around $165 million. Um, We reckon that the upper ceiling will be $800 million. So the lifetime cost of the scheme will lie somewhere between those two figures. I suspect um, that it will be less, significantly less than the 800 million, but significantly more than the 165 million that was initially estimated. We can't obviously estimate the degree to which psychological um, and physical injuries overlap either, um, because we, until we know who the applicants are, it's impossible to assess that. So because it's a demand-led scheme, 
and it's driven by applications, it is very difficult um, to know precisely how many people are likely to be affected. Um, so these are, if you like, best estimates, but they're, they're not necessarily um, entirely reflective of what might happen once, um, once the scheme opens. And we also would not necessarily have sight um, of people who live in other jurisdictions, but who may be eligible um, to apply. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Linda, Sinead. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, obviously, I have, I have a, a, a lot of <coughs> queries around this, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and tie it down. And I don't want to go back over old ground, but I am going to say, and I know it's not your responsibility, but this payment scheme, or as it was originally intended to be, was a pension for the permanently and severely injured, um, which, it, in my thinking, and to my mind, even by reducing the psychological from 40% to 14%, threw that out the window for a start, if you don't even go into all of the rest of the stuff that was done by the NIO and the British Government in relation to this legislation. So I suppose on that basis, I'll come to my first point. This is British Government legislation, but they want our executive to finance it out of the block grant, which means they want us to take money from our health system, from our education system, from our housing system, from helping victims of domestic abuse, from all of those different aspects to fund this, their legislation, which they took what had been almost agreed by both victims groups and political parties here and decided they would throw that out the window and they would decide who they think should get paid. So it, it it had a bad starting point. Having said that, I do agree that there are many victims out there that have waited far too long and that needed this to be put in place. And I actually met with um, WAVE last week. So obviously they've raised a number of concerns which would, we would share, and that is the financing of it. I, I don't want to go into the wider stuff around legacy, but just to, if I can get a quick answer on whether there has been any conversations with the British government around the HIU, because they have raised concerns, and that's across the board. That seems to be coming from, from victims' groups and, and victims right across the board in relation to the HIU. And then just... The, the Secretary of State made some comments a number of weeks ago around the... As I've already said, the eligibility is, is an issue. However, he also said that where the panel comes to a decision that if in, in layman's terms if he doesn't think it's right he'll interfere how do we guarantee the independence of a panel an independent panel which can be interfered with politically is not independent that's the bottom line i mean i wouldn't like to see if any party here went and started trying to interfere in the hia payments because we didn't like somebody who was who happened to be a victim it wouldn't be right it wouldn't be appropriate and I just think that it's, it's, it's not the right way to go forward. If they're an independent panel and they're basing their decisions based on what's in front of them in the legislation and the guidance, then we're removing their independence by allowing for political interference. So I think that's an issue and I'm just seeking reassurance from the Minister on how an independent panel will actually, in real terms, be independent in those circumstances. Um, you've answered some of my other questions, to be, to be fair, Minister, so I'm not going to, to go over it. Just one other query I have, and, and this is a concern as well. So if we were to get in place the, the, the finance and we're able to start making payments and there then came legal challenges, which you know I have no doubt at some stage, somewhere along the line, even if only for the reason that the chair has outlined, that some people have been given some kind of false expectation, that you could have a legal challenge there. Will that halt the process or will the process be able to continue okay. whilst the legal actions are ongoing? Because I would have fears, and, and I outlined this to the, to the groups when I met them, because in everything I try to be honest about expectations and I try to be honest with people, particularly people who have been so badly hurt and so badly let down for so many years. So I would like them to have some clarity around that, that if this gets up and running, that if there are legal challenges, that that will be a separate process, and that they will still be able to receive the payments, you know, whilst that's ongoing. And I'm not sure; it may well depend on the on the type of challenge. To be fair, so. 
Um, I'll, I'll try to deal with those in order. I mean, first of all, in terms of funding, I mean, I agree um, that the government must make some contribution um, to this. I have written to the Secretary of State and made my view on that clear. Um, I know that we met um, as an executive. Where, well, actually, um, First Minister, Deputy First Minister, um, and Finance Minister and myself met um, to discuss the issue of finance um, and agree that we would write and request a meeting um, with the Secretary of State and you'll be aware obviously from um, TEO questions yesterday that the uh, response that we had from the Secretary of State um, basically told us that we had sufficient funds. Um, so he didn't say he wouldn't meet, he just ignored the request for a meeting. Um, so I, I think we can read into that what we wish. Um, so there is an issue um, around funding. I mean, I agree that there are challenges, twofold challenges here. I mean, first of all, it is correct that the executive <clears throat> and the sector of state is correct that the executive had committed to taking forward a scheme of this nature and had lobbied to do so. Um, they'd never said that they would pay for it all, um, that they, or that they would be able to, which is why um, one of the reasons why the negotiations were ongoing um, around how the scheme would be formulated, um, because some of these issues um, date back to, obviously, in terms of historic issues, date back to a time when the NIO and others would have had more control over these issues, and so it would, have, to me, be appropriate um, for them to make a contribution. It's also part of the wider legacy. Um, approach, I think, um, and that should also be considered. However, fundamentally, whatever the executive had or hadn't agreed is not what we're dealing with now. It is a scheme that the NIO designed. Now, the Secretary of State will say, again, rightly, that he took it forward in the absence of an executive and assembly being here to do so. Um, but he also changed it dramatically from what was originally agreed. And I think that that departure means that it is his policy um, and his scheme. And Treasury rules would say that if he designed the scheme, he should also fund the scheme. Um, I think realistically, all of us in the executive know um, that to take money from uh, one set of people who are in need and give it to another is not necessarily um, a good way forward. Um, we, would, we would prefer to see this scheme, of course it is a priority, but we would prefer to see this scheme um, funded in a way that is sustainable. I think that is possible. Um, and I would really want to um, encourage the Secretary of State and Treasury to engage with us on this, um, because I think it's important that we move forward. Um, there have been some references to other pots of money we have had um, in responses from the Secretary of State. Um, there has been reference to the money we have received as a result of COVID, which is all well and good, but not unique to Northern Ireland, um, and absolutely nothing to do uh, with those who have permanent disablement as a result of the Troubles. Um, there is discussion about other funding that we've received for other purposes, but again, all well and good, but nothing to do um, with the, this particular issue. And so I think that we need to have that conversation about how we are going to fund this going forward. I would want to stress that I don't want this to become an issue where there is a, a political row developing in the public space, because I think that that in itself is distressing and re-traumatising to victims. And I have made this point repeatedly um, to everyone concerned that I think it is important that as politicians, we take this offline and we deal with it in a mature and sensible way. We reach an agreement as to how it will be funded that is fair and equitable and we get it done um, and that is the bottom line for me um, so I would still see that as the way forward and I know that executive colleagues very much want this to be resolved and resolved quickly and quietly I don't want to be frankly in a situation where victims feel again obliged um, to trek around the countryside um, pleading for something which they have a right to receive so I think that that would be really unfair um, an unfair transfer of responsibility to them um, for something which is our responsibility to resolve. In terms of the HIU and the wider legacy piece, um, you'll be aware obviously of the Northern Ireland Affairs Select Committee report um, into the, the legacy um, issue. It is rare, I think, for um, a report from a committee in the House of Commons to be quite so universally um, dismissive um, of what the Secretary of State has brought forward. Um, you will also be aware that the Secretary of State said that he was unable to um, give evidence to the committee because it was at a delicate stage of engagement, um, intensive engagement with all of the parties. But you will also be aware that there is no engagement currently happening with all of the parties. Um, and my understanding is that that has been um, largely down to the fact that we have a situation with 
COVID-19 um, and therefore the kind of face-to-face -face, um, and rather delicate discussions that would need to be had around this issue, I don't think will proceed um, in, in the short term. Um, it does leave us in, I think, quite a difficult situation in the department. Reference, for example, has been made to some of the money um, for legacy in terms of funding um, the victim's pension. I wrote to the Secretary of State and specifically asked him about that issue. Um, he wrote back and specifically did not answer that point. Um, so I, I suspect that it wouldn't be a I suspect it would be difficult because if he said, yes, you can have that money to put towards the victim's pension, then it would be an admission um, that the the legacy structures aren't going anywhere um, f soon. So I, I think that for that reason, um, you know, that that's unlikely to happen. But we have um, previously made approaches to the Northern Ireland office about being able to draw that funding down for other legacy work and have been told that it is not available for anything other um, than setting up the structures around the HIU and the other Stormont House Agreement structures. So I think we set that funding to the side, and although the Secretary of State likes to refer to it, um, when we talk about the funding for um, the victim's pension, it's not something that we will have access to in order to pay the victim's pension, so I think we just need to be honest about that. In terms of where wider legacy lands, it's very hard to see until we get clarity as to what the government um, wants to actually do and until the engagement with parties starts to actually um, take, take off. The third point you raised is about this pressure release valve that the Secretary of State referred to. I think it was in his um, press release that went alongside um, the, um, the, the issue of the guidance. Um, so it's not included in the guidance, it's not included in the regulations. I wrote to the Secretary of State specifically asking for clarity on what that looked like because I believe that, for example, when we're appointing a judge to lead the panel, we need to understand what that would look like if a politician were able to overrule um, a decision made by the judiciary and what the implications of that might be for the independence of the panel. The Secretary of State um, has responded um, just um, in the last sort of 48 hours um, to say that work on that is still ongoing. So they don't have a clear, uh, there was no kind of clear mechanism um, that they have conceived of that would be used for that purpose. Um, I'm concerned about there being a mechanism at all, and I've been very clear about that. I believe that the panel, when it's appointed, ought to be independent. It ought to be able to do its job. It has to work within the regulations and the guidance, and that's clear. Um, so I think then it should be left to do that independently and not subject to political interference. And on the final point with respect to legal challenges, I have to say that you're, you're correct. It will depend on the legal challenge and the view of the judge. So it may be that a judge would receive a legal challenge and decide that all payments are to stop until the issue is resolved, depending on how significant it is. Or it may be that they decide because each case is considered on its merit and it isn't a finite amount of money, for example. So if you have a fixed pot that's going to be split by all the available applicants, there would be an argument that you couldn't decide on any until you decided on all. Um, if it's not on that scheme, they may decide that you can continue. But if it is a fundamental issue about how the panel, for example, are applying the regulations and guidance, they may decide that you can't proceed until that matter of law has been clarified. So it is difficult to assess what impact future legal challenges uh, will have. But I think, as with all legal challenges, they run the risk of creating further delay. I appreciate that. Can I ask one last question that will be a yes yeah. or no? Is there an appeals process in the, in included in the applications process? I'm, I'd need to come back to you on that. I'm not, I can't, can't remember the detail. Okay, if I, if I can get some clarity yeah, around that, I, I just think that's important. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, Sinead. Thank you. Here. Um, I want to thank the Minister and Permanent Secretary for being here. It is important to, to get these types of briefings where we can get to the detail, and you have covered a lot of it, to be fair, in the answers so far. Um, I was going to ask, you know, the Minister, you did say that uh, meeting with the Secretary of State, Secretary of State had not been arranged to date. My question was, had you asked for the meeting? But obviously, yes. You know, through the correspondence, it's clear you have, and the, the um, deliberate um, intent of actually ignoring the fact that you did ask for the meeting is not going down too well. And I just want to make um, an assertion. You referred to the, the letter, I suppose, of the request coming from First Minister, Deputy First Minister, Finance Minister and Justice. And I'm not sure if there's any nuance there as opposed to did the Secretary of State ignore a request from the executive or was this compilation of a group of people, some, that entity, somehow different? And I would also say, 
As we all know, if somebody chooses to ignore a point in your letter, you immediately go straight back. Has that happened? Um, has a letter from the executive gone straight back to the Secretary of State to pin down that essential meeting? Because with the system, while, while we're going through the detail of it, and I appreciate you being here to do that, all of this is to no end if there's no money there to pay for it. So I think it's critical that that meeting happens as soon as possible. Um, just on a second point, Minister, you mentioned um, in passing that the panel may have to consider if other funding might already have been paid to victims. Um, and I'm just curious to know, is that from the public purse, are you thinking, or what type of payments were you referring to there? Thank you. Um, on the last point first, yes, it would be where somebody, for example, has permanent disablement payment um, or pension from another source. That would have to be taken into account. Um, and that is my understanding of, of how it works. So they would need to look if somebody has another permanent disablement payment for the same disability, um, that that would have to be taken into account when they make their award. Um, with respect to the, the letter, the letter was written on behalf of the, the four departments who have, if you like, an interest in this, so TEO, um, the Department of Finance um, and the Department for Justice. So th those, were the, those were the four departments who were, with four ministers who were intended to meet. Um, I can't recall, to be blunt, the, the wording of, of the letter, whether it said on behalf of the executive, but it was a, it was a request to meet with those four <coughs> ministers. Um, in terms of going back, there were a number of letters written. I had written originally to the Secretary of State to clarify the issues around um, the legacy money that came from um, NDNA and indeed preceded that, that are being held by the NIO um, for the HIU and Stormont House, um, and also to clarify this issue around the pressure valve or whatever they've called it um, and then a further letter went from um, the first and deputy first minister specifically asking for this meeting um, to happen with respect to the finance um, issue um, and we have now had responses to both those letters neither of which have been um, particularly helpful. We haven't yet met as an executive to discuss the correspondence um, but I am in the process today having received the letter last night um, of responding um, to the Secretary of State. So I can assure you there will be no time lost um, in, in going back um, and, uh, and um, just letting um, him know um, our views and seeking clarity on those issues which were not responded to um, uh, in the letter. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sinead, Minister. Rachel Woods. Thank you, um, and thank you, Minister and Peter, as well, for attending today. And most of my questions have actually been answered. Um, and, and, and discussed on obviously this is all dependent on funding we can set up as many structures and processes as we want but there's no money to pay for it so i'm just wondering if there's been any discussion i appreciate you might not be able to go into it at executive level of you know what happens there's absolutely nothing coming from the uk government um covered in terms of the uh, meeting requests with the secretary of state in terms if it wasn't so ser serious that response from the secretary of state is pretty laughable um, I don't think that's appropriate, um, and the fact that you, you know, a, a meeting request has been ignored, it's just, I, I just, I don't think that's acceptable from from the Secretary of State, especially when it's coming from four ministers. Um, I suppose uh, with the legacy issue, um, we know about the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee, their interim report in October, um, and certainly there has been no engagement with all the parties. Not all of the parties have ever been engaged on Stormont House. Our party being one of them, so whenever um, it's discussed about all parties, that's incorrect. Um, but in terms of the any discussions between the NIO and the department on legacy, has there been anything since the publication of that Northern Ireland Affairs interim report? Okay, there are a couple of issues. What would happen if we don't get the funding? I mean, first and foremost, my responsibility and my legal duty is to produce the scheme, and that's what I'm going to do. Um, and if others fail in their duty to provide the funding for it, that is a matter that I will not be happy about, but it's one that I can't control. But I can control the fact that we will get the scheme up and we will have it ready to go, and then it will be a matter of finding the funding. I want to do that early, which is one of the reasons why I met with the Finance Minister and then met with the Finance Minister along with um, the Executive Office ministers because I think it's important that we take um, we take this as an urgent matter now and don't wait until the scheme is ready to open before we get to a point where we're talking about the funding. In terms of where it comes from, um, if the 
UK government doesn't make a contribution. Well, there are two things that may help to determine that. The first is that there is likely to be another court case. Um, so we know that that's in train already. Um, and that may get a formal ruling with respect to the funding. Um, so that's one element. And the second is that we already know um, from Justice McAlinden's um, remarks in the previous court case, um, which ruled that the scheme had to be, the department had to be designated and the scheme um, developed, that he had already indicated that if this came back before him, he had a view on how the funding would be handled. Um, and he said that it was the responsibility of the executive office to provide funding to the designated department in order that they could disperse those funds to victims. Um, now, I could sit back and say, well, well that's me off the hook then. Um, I will just design the scheme and then go cap in hand. And it's up to TEO and the finance minister to take tough decisions uh, where they wish. It's not my problem. I think that would be irresponsible of me as a minister of the executive um, when we have collective responsibility and we're supposed to be working together. I recognise that this would be incredibly challenging um, for colleagues in the executive from all parties to be able to find the funding um, that it would require us, particularly, I think, to get the initial payments done. I actually think the recurrent payments on an annual basis are something that the executive potentially would be able to deal with. But I think that the initial payments, which will include back payments, but also potentially people who opt to take a, a lump sum payment rather than a recurrent payment, um, both of those things I think could be significant. And the timing and spacing of those payments will have an impact on how affordable they are. So I think that there are issues there that do need to be addressed. And that's why I initiated meetings with um, my executive colleagues about this because I, I don't want to sit back and wait and then point the finger at somebody else. I want to get involved and support colleagues in the, in the case that they make um, to the Secretary of State and indeed to Treasury um, because I think that both need to be involved in these conversations um, in order that we can deal with this. So, I mean, technically... It's for TEO to get the money from the Department of Finance, but we all know that that ultimately means it will come from the pockets of other departments. That's the only place that the money can, um, because we don't have enough money um, for a standstill position um, in those circumstances. Um, with respect to discussions with the NIO on legacy, the discussions with the NIO on legacy, and I think Peter would be fair to say, um, had been reasonably intensive around the HIU and so on at the beginning of the year. Um, but after the Secretary of State's um, statement um, to Westminster, his ministerial statement, I think there's been no substantive engagement whatsoever on legacy um, at all with the NIO. And I wouldn't expect that there would be. To some degree, our involvement in this has also changed because whilst the HIU was very clearly a justice instrument and something that sat comfortably, I think, within the Justice Department, given that it was about investigation, um, it was about justice, it was about um, providing people with clarity under Article 2 and everything else, there was a certain logic um, that it would lie within the Department of Justice. It's actually very unclear what this curate's egg that they've come up with is going to, is going to, is going to be, um, whether it's about justice, whether it's about truth recovery, whether it's about reconciliation, whether it's about... I don't really know what it's about. So I think I'm, it's much more questionable whether there's any direct role for the Department of Justice in that particular um, scenario. And until we get clarity on the structures, it will be very hard to tell. In terms of the HIU, obviously there was preparatory work ongoing um, and the Department had advanced that um, just in not to a great degree, but had thought through what the, the implications of that might be for the department where we required to do it. But I mean, all work in that regard has stopped because there is, at this stage, no clarity as to where we go next. So it wouldn't make sense for us to have it be invested in any time in that. Sure, just one <coughs> follow up. Sorry, just re with regard to um, the changes that obviously the board announced in the press in March. Um, uh, it's very concerning that there's been no substantive engagement. Has there been any um, attempts by the department to engage with the NIO on this matter? No, I mean, initially um, we asked for clarity um, around this. Um, we had officials who uh, attended, I think, some of the discussions around the HIU for a period of time, but those meetings have ceased to take place, is my understanding. 
Um, and again, I would be quite reluctant for officials' time to be taken up with something that is so unclear. And if I could just reassure you, um, if I may, um, I wouldn't want the Green Party to feel left out. I mean, nobody's being spoken to about this issue. I know that very often you are overlooked and not engaged on these issues, but on this occasion, you're one of the majority um, who are not being engaged. So you, you don't need to worry about that. And uh, it's we're, we're we're all in the same we're all in the same level of darkness on this particular. Issue. Uh, Minister, I appreciate that for, for once we're all in the same boat then, um, but we do get you know put into this love of course of all and course. that makes things quite confusing. I no, appreciate that and certainly I wouldn't want officials' time to be wasted, it is precious enough. Um, it's just incredibly disappointing and um, certainly that um, committee report was de quite damning um, and should be taken on board. Thank you. I think members will have heard that bells. So that's four minutes left and we'll be concluding this meeting. So Gordon Dunn um, had indicated maybe we've covered this issue enough, but no, just and I, I want to be coming back. She had asked on the legislative programme for it to be brought on. So um, Gordon, if you could just do. briefly, Minister, are you satisfied you have the correct processes and procedures in place? It's a major project. There's a lot of money involved. Those of us that have been around here for a while realise the risks that there are with projects. Uh, and about financial management, I think is very important and accountability. So, you know, what process and procedures have been put in place to give us all assurance that that your system is robust and fit for purpose? Well, I'm going to pass that one um, to the chief accounting officer for the department because I think it's appropriate um, <laughs> that he gives you reassurance because he needs yeah. to be reassured that the appropriate checks and balances are in place. So there is. Um, two sets of overarching machinery, one of which is led by the executive officer who, who retain an overall responsibility for the scheme, and then there's a project board which is chaired from within the Department of Justice that draws together relevant uh, people both within the department and from outside, and we will be putting in place absolutely all of the right mechanisms as the part of the reason why it's taking some time to get to the we point where... we following in the principles of project management, would that be fair? Indeed. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, Following, uh, absolutely tr trying to make sure that we do this properly and we recognise that the nature of a, a scheme of this nature with the payments that are involved, particularly uh, this isn't even one-off payments, these are recurring payments, so we need to absolutely make sure we've got the right <coughs> IT, IT systems in place and uh, the right mechanisms in place to ensure that uh, only those people who are eligible for the funding get the money, but those who, do, who are eligible get all that they're entitled to at the right point in time on an ongoing basis. And that those complexities are some of the reasons why it's taking time to get to the point where the scheme can start and, and, and before payments can be made. It will be regularly reviewed and subject to internal audit? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I haven't been discussing uh, the use of internal audit yet, but at some stage we will absolutely make sure that there is a, a proper review process as to the, the progress that is being made. As soon as possible, yeah. Well, I think at the right point, because you need to have made enough progress to have something to review. So uh, I think we need to make the, the judgment call as to when the right point is to do that. Thanks very much. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Do you want to raise an issue on the legislative No, program? Chair, to be fair, the Minister was quite um, detailed in her opening remarks and on the floor yesterday, so okay. I'm more than happy to let it go with that. Thank, Thank you. you. Probably some areas in the legislative programme we might, as a committee, pick up on Thursday, but Emma? I was just around that, but if we're going to pick it up on committee, that should be... I'll, I'll if, if you want, listen, we'll, we'll, one more minute and then... It we'll might take you more than a minute. <laughs> 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 OK, well, listen, we, as a committee, we, we can discuss if there's issues that we want to yeah, bring to the Minister on. Yeah. Um, we're due to meet on the 15th of December again. No doubt there'll be issues arise in the interim that we may want to raise with you. But um, nevertheless, if I can thank you for taking the time, Minister, to meet with us on a Tuesday afternoon. It's not something we necessarily want to <laughs> make a regular thing. Cause oh, I didn't know. I thought it was fun. <laughs> well, all, everyone's under time pressures and all party groups and all of that. But... Um, it is important that we, sure. as a committee, well, thank you very much. And look, if there are issues, particularly around the legislative programme, um, if there are any issues where I can be of assistance, I'm happy even informally just to have a chat with any of you who have queries or questions um, and try to resolve those. Because, as I say, it, I, I think that there is a real opportunity here to show that a legislative assembly is just that, that it legislates and makes a difference. And I think it's important um, in terms of public confidence in what we do. So I'm happy to engage if it's of assistance at any time. Okay, well, listen, thank, thank you. you. There was a couple
couple of points you're going to follow up in writing, which I know we, we will get Perfect. in due course. But members, we have our meeting on Thursday again at two o'clock, so in this room. So I'll see you on Thursday. Thank you. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee.